I give thanks to you, O Lord God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forever, for great is your steadfast love toward me. Indeed, how great is the steadfast love of the Lord toward us, and what a joy to sing about it together like we just were. You have to forgive me, I'm a little disoriented. We're sitting over here, we're not in our approved place. And it's, it's, it's rather disturbing. I, 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 I don't know exactly what angle this is here, but uh, it's, you just got to get used to it, and then you adjust a little bit. So we're, we're trying to visit around uh, a little bit uh, now and then. So we might, we might pop up in your section. Don't, don't be alarmed. It's, uh, it's a joy to have visitors with us. We're glad you're here. It's a holiday weekend, so maybe some are visiting family Maybe you're in a town um, just for a couple of days and you took time to worship with us. We're glad for that. And no doubt we have others who are out of town traveling. But we're thankful we're all here together in the presence of God. All right, now brace you. This will be an alarming shift. But um, some of you may recognize who these guys are, as we say back home in western New York. That's what they look like now, but back when I was a wee lad in 1979, I know when, Bernard, when you hear 1979, you think, oh, to be 82 again. I know, it's just (laughs) nostalgia washes over him. But 1979, I was just a kid in uh, junior high, and this is what they looked like then with a different front man singing for ACDC. And this album and this song, the title track from this album, got a lot of playtime on the radio when I was in high school, and it has become a classic. You'll hear it in frequent rotation on class, uh, classic rock stations. Uh, I've heard it, you know, at sporting events when they're blasting rock tunes over the, the, the PA system. Uh, we hear it a lot, but, you know, even as a kid, even as a kid, when I wasn't actively following God, I still, I still believed in the Lord. I still believed in God. And, and I was alarmed that people could sing so, in such a cavalier way, almost like celebrating. It's this anthem, celebrating, yes, look at me. I'm heading to hell. I'm on the highway to hell. And I know it's tongue-in-cheek. It's facetious. It's really this rebellious spirit intended to shock. That was a big part of harder rock music, of course, in that era, and it's a big part of a, a lot of popular music today, but it, it kind of disturbed me. Here, here you have lyrics saying, I- I'm going down, party time, and my friends are going to be there too. I'm on the highway to hell. You, you heard that? Some of you heard this song before? Uh, well, it, it is a joke to a lot of people. But it's no laughing matter. We're talking about matters that are of the utmost seriousness. I don't know what could be more sobering to contemplate than whether or not there is a highway to hell. There is indeed a highway to hell. It's the broad way. It's the easiest, in one sense, path to follow. To be on it, all you have to do is nothing. There is a highway to hell, and... It's important we know whether or not we're on it. So we're going to talk about that in the lesson this morning. This is a continuation of this series, Heaven, Hell, and the Christian Hope. We've got the more positive sermons to come when we shift our focus uh, to the hope of eternal life and the resurrection. And we'll look at some interesting questions that arise about where are the dead, will there be degrees of reward In heaven and punishment in hell, will we recognize one another and all that? So we'll look at some of those interesting things. But what we've seen so far, we had two lessons on the coming judgment. And this is now our third lesson on hell. Can you imagine that? There are a lot of places, a lot of churches, where you wouldn't hear a single sermon about the judgment day, uh, much less two, or a single sermon or reference even to hell, much less several lessons on it. I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. I appreciate 
standing before a congregation with, and having elders who want to hear the whole counsel of God, even in matters that are not palatable, and maybe we'd rather not have to think about these things, but we do, and so we are. So you can put that same title back up, and let's continue now with this lesson. Hell, eternity without God, our final lesson on this. We looked at what it's going to be like, eternal separation from God. Last time we talked about the objection that the idea of eternal punishment is unjust and that would make a monster of God. How can you worship this Christian God if he's going to send people to eternal torment? That's a serious objection and it needs to be considered and so we looked at that. But now, now the question, who's going to be there? Who's going to be there? Now when we raise this question... Immediately, people would say, wait, wait a minute. No one knows who's going to be saved or who's going to be lost. Who are you to make a judgment like that? And of course, in our culture, it's taboo to judge, right? We're, we're not supposed to pass judgment on anyone, even though we all make moral judgments every single day. It's impossible not to. But yet we're told when people want to remove any objections to their own beliefs and behavior, oh, we're not supposed to judge. You're not supposed to get up in the pulpit, get up in church, stand before the congregation and worship and talk about, Here, here's who's going to hell. Well, let's put this in proper perspective. We're not making the judgment in this regard, right? God is judge, and he will judge us through Jesus Christ, Acts 17, 30, and 31. So we're going to his word, and his word reveals to us whom he has said will be lost. God is the one making the determination based upon what we choose, whether to respond to him or reject him. But this is God's determination. This is God's decree, and we're simply recognizing what God has said in his word. I think that's important to settle right from the start. Who's going to be in hell? All right, let's answer the question. First of all, the devil and his angels, the devil and demons. And the reason I'm mentioning this, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 41, that those who are sent away from him in the judgment, who will be lost forever, depart from me, he said, you cursed into the eternal fire. It's a place, he said, prepared for the devil and his angels. And we want to hasten to add here that the devil is not ruling in hell. That's the popular image that persists in the minds of most people. You see it in all the way back in, in medieval artwork, and you see it so often in pop culture, and it's this idea that, okay, God sends you to hell, and the devil's in charge of hell and administering everyone's torment, and his demons are the ones tormenting everyone, right? Isn't that the way most people think? of hell, that caricature that we see so often. And it is absolutely untrue. The, the scriptures tell us, and we're not taking time to go into this, but in 2 Peter 2 and Jude, the, the, that one chapter epistle, the, the devil and his angels are being punished in hell. They're suffering torment in hell. And I don't want to be in a place that God designed for their eternal punishment. I don't want to be in that condition. That alone should make me not want to be in hell if I knew nothing else about it, that it's a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Who else will be there? Now, what I'm going to put before you here are several categories based on some key texts in the Bible that talk about hell, some of which we've already looked at. And some of these are obviously overlapping. These are different ways of expressing some of the same categories. But when we look at these texts, what do we see? Well, we see the immoral, the unfaithful. Why am I saying that? Because in Revelation 21, when John has this glorious vision at the end of the age and the consummation of all things, and he sees Jesus Christ on the throne, he who is seated on the throne, he says, says, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And that's a way of emphasizing the absolute certainty of these things. 
The one who conquers, meaning those who are faithful to him. That's what Revelation has shown, that if we stay faithful to the Lord, even through all suffering, we conquer and we reign with him. He says, we'll have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But, verse 8, as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So this is the Lord. He hears this voice from the throne saying this. Let's look at some of those whom this passage tells us will be in hell. Murderers. Well, of course, almost everyone would agree on that. But doesn't that stress the importance of the sanctity of human life? And that those who undermine the sanctity of, of human life, even unborn life, but those who contribute to the erosion of the biblical ethic of the sanctity of life, those who approve of and would support and condone the taking of innocent life, will have blood on their hands. And murderers will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, the second death. And the sexually immoral, yes, people will be in hell for not... Being sexually pure, we're living in an age of sexual hedonism where people think that the highest liberty is to pursue whatever sexual pleasure you desire unhindered. And any, any restraint on that, any condemnation of that, any inhibition of those desires is considered wrong, unhealthy and even wrong. But the fact of the matter is, if we engage in sex outside of you know, one man and one woman joined together for life in a scriptural marriage, any sexual activity outside of that, unforgiven by the blood of Christ, will cause us to be lost in the day of judgment. Yes, what we do with our bodies matters. And our sexual behavior and our sexual beliefs matter. And we can be lost for rejecting God's will on sexual purity. But notice here, too, he mentions sorcerers and idolaters and the detestable. These are categories, the detestable or abominable. These are, that's a term used in Leviticus and elsewhere in Scripture of practices connected with idolatry. And so the church, Revelation was written to the saints who were persecuted by the pagans, by the idol worshipers. And there's a condemnation here at the end of this book about those who in, engage in those kinds of practices will be lost. And that might be the idea behind the liars, too. Those who uh, lied and gave false testimony against Christians and caused them to be martyred, or those who made false professions of faith. You see, but truth matters. So liars, we don't have time to explore each one of these, but what is quite remarkable here is the cowardly, Cowardly people are going to be in hell? The faithless, yes, the, notice the linkage there, that's important. Your Bible might say the fearful. In the context of Revelation, the point being made here is the church is facing persecution, violent persecution. And those who are fearful and compromise their faith, who deny the faith, because they're cowardly, they're fearful of the persecution they would face. They're not willing to persevere and be faithful even to the point of giving their lives. Revelation 2.10. They will be lost in hell. So the warning here is we have to be faithful to Christ at all costs, no matter what we have to suffer or we'll be lost. Yet think of the things that seem, in comparison, so trivial that people use as excuses for not faithfully following Christ. Yes, it's hard. We have to bear our crosses. But if we're not willing to persevere even to the point of torture and death, that's what Revelation is talking about, we will be lost. So that's a very powerful warning. The Bible tells us false teachers and those who believe them will suffer in hell as well. So in other words, our religious doctrine matters. It's not just, well, believe whatever you want. And Peter, there's a lengthy passage here. I'm not going to go through it all. But Peter warns about false Peter, uh, <laughs> preachers 
uh, in 2 Peter 2, 1 through 4. False prophets were among the people, just as there'll be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them and bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Now that destruction is alluding to their ultimate fate in hell. And, and he says many will follow their sensuality. So a lot of people who preach to get a big following. And it's a carnal false gospel that appeals to people. And he says because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And we see that a lot with false religion and how it brings a, a, a terrible image of Christ and his church and brings, causes people to speak against the church. But it's, it's false religion. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words, their condemnation from long ago. It's not idle. Their destruction's not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell. And we'll look at this later. That's not the same word for hell elsewhere that Jesus used, Gehenna. But talking about a place of torment. The ESV translated it with the word hell. But the point is they're, they're, they're in a condition, they're in a place where they're being punished, where they're suffering. Committed then the chains of gloomy darkness to, to be kept until the judgment when then they'll be cast into the eternal fire. And then at the end of the chapter, see there's a warning here. If after they've escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in them and overcome, the last states become worse than the first. So in other words... You see, if you are saved and you were delivered from this corruption and then you turn back to the world and you're overcoming it again, it, it's worse for you than if you were never saved. He says it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. That's, that's a powerful warning, isn't it? Now, when you talk about false teachers, Jesus warned about the Jewish leaders, Matthew 23, 15. Woe to you! This is Jesus. This is a Jesus many don't know. But this is the Lord Jesus. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! You travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. So people who lead others astray, those who are led astray because they're, they're not careful and they're careless and they allow themselves to be led into damning error. We don't mean every single uh, uh, belief. We're talking about essential doctrine that is crucial to our salvation. Fundamental matters of the faith. They're, they're led astray into false teaching, they'll lose their souls and, and those who lead them astray. But I emphasize this because hell is specifically mentioned in connection with these things. And so it's not just, well, whatever your religious beliefs are, that's fine. Just be a religious person and, and we can't pass judgment on other people's religious views. No, it, it matters what we believe, you see. The Bible tells us worldly, lukewarm, unfaithful Christians will be lost. I know here's overlap again, but I wanted to get this passage in because in Hebrews 2, again, he's writing to those who are being persecuted and who are tempted to leave Christ, to separate themselves from the church and go back Jewish believers who wanted to just go back to practicing their Judaism to avoid persecution. He says, therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard. Do you hear this? lest we drift away. So it isn't that we're just warned that one day you might decide you hate God and renounce Christ, but just drifting away because you're not careful to develop your faith, to develop spiritual discipline, to walk in the ways of the Lord. He says, for since the message declared by angels, he's talking about the Old Testament covenant, prove reliable and every transgression or obedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape? So if they were punished, if they forsook God under the Old Covenant, how will we escape? But here's what he says, if we neglect such a great salvation, what God has done for us, and if we act like that doesn't really matter in our lives and we just neglect that and we drift away, our souls are in danger of eternal damnation. It's powerful. Unfaithful servants of God. What did Jesus say 
in Matthew 25 in the parable of the talents. Again, I'm using these references. You, know, you could talk about, well, who's going to be in hell by looking at the passages that talk about who will be in heaven. You could do the converse and say, well, here, here's who will be in heaven, so anyone who doesn't do that will be in hell. But I'm trying to look at verses where you have these specific warnings about hell. And in the parable of the talents, Jesus talked about the servant who didn't use what his master entrusted to him. And, and this is the text we've cited several times. Matthew 25, 30, cast that worthless servant into ardor darkness. In that place there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow, Jesus, serious, these very strong words of warning, this condemnation because someone, what did he do? Nothing. He didn't serve God with what God entrusted to him. See, those you could add here in the judgment parable that follows this one, in the judgment scene where Jesus depicts the judgment day and he separates the sheep from the goats the saved from the lost. And he talks about those who don't serve others. Matthew 25, you remember? Where he said, He'll say to those on the left, Depart from me, ye cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. All right, we've noticed that verse, but let's go on. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you, you did not visit me. So in other words, you see, people can be lost for what they don't do, you see. I can be lost because I'm indifferent to the needs of people around me who might have the opportunity to serve. Jesus said, these will go away into eternal punishment. So I know we, we look at that first verse, Revelation 28. Yes, murderers, they're going to be in hell. Those murderers and the liars, the idolaters. Oh, yes, those pagans, the immoral, all those fornicators. But you know, look what Jesus said here. If I'm not concerned about helping my fellow man with what he's given me. So what, what does this mean? It's sobering because many good, that means even people we would think of as good, decent people. Maybe even devoutly religious people will be in hell. There'll, there'll be many, many people in hell who have been baptized. There'll be many, many people in hell, no doubt, who attended church every Sunday. God forbid, but it's entirely possible, some sitting here in this auditorium right now, even though you believe in God, and maybe your beliefs line up correctly with Scripture, but it's quite possible, some sitting here right now, if the Lord were to come back right now, you would be in hell forever. That's sobering to contemplate. It's not just those people out there who are terrible people, the, the mass murderers, the Pol Pots and the Hitlers and the Stalins. You know, even those who identify as Christian is the point you see here, that God holds us accountable for what He has given to us. But what about those who are outside of Christ, those who do not seek God? who don't believe in Jesus, who don't obey the gospel. And I'm going to address, Lord willing, I plan to, I'm trying to think about how best to do this. In another lesson, when we look at some related questions, what about those who've, who've never heard? I mentioned that in class this morning. But, but for now, let's just notice what Scripture tells us here. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1, when Jesus comes from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, he'll inflict vengeance on those who, now here, who do not know God. That means you're not in a saving relationship with God. Who do not obey the gospel. You have to believe the gospel and submit to the gospel. Surrender and live in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord for the glory of His might. I know those who are not Christians, who are critical of the Christian worldview, they think it's monstrous. You mean people have to believe your religion, that you're the only right way, and that anybody who's not a Christian is going to burn in hell forever? Well, listen, this is a matter of those who refuse to believe God, who refuse to believe 
what he has done in Christ, how he's revealed himself in Christ and offered salvation in Christ and then given us the conditions to receive that salvation. They will suffer punishment. Yes, they'll be sent away from the Lord forever. And another way to say it is the way it's said in Revelation 20. Anyone not written in the Lamb's book of life. Here's the great white throne judgment scene, Revelation 20. I saw a great white throne, him seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away. There was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, that's everyone, standing before the throne. And he said the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books. This is what we talked about earlier, according to what they had done. This is why I need the sinful things I've done and the and times I've sinned by failing to do what I ought to do. I need that wiped clean from my record because I'm going to stand before God in judgment. And that book of my life is going to be open. But if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And that's a, that's a poetic way of saying, now maybe there is an actual book and my name's there, but it's the idea of God knows those who belong to him and who have submitted to the gospel to receive his salvation. But you know, this is sad to say we take no pleasure in contemplating this at all. But who's going to be in hell? If I understand Jesus correctly in Matthew seven thirteen and 14 about the, the way to destruction is, is broad, many are those who enter it, but the, the way to life is narrow and few are those who find it, then most people will be in hell. But no one has to be. No one has to be. See, that's the good news. The good news is, and, and I know it breaks our hearts. I said when we started this, we don't want to be insensitive because all of us know people that we love dearly who died away from God. We have to think about ourselves. We can't do anything about the souls of others who have gone on. But you can do something about your own soul. You don't have to be lost because God, this is what the gospel's about, right? John 3, 16, I could give passage after passage, but this audience, I know we know this, the good news that God in his love gave his son to bear our sins, to suffer that punishment in our place, to save us from his wrath, to deliver us from hell. Here's the warning of the prophet God speaking through Ezekiel, I think this is what God speaks to us through the gospel today as well. He said to Israel, he sent the prophet to them to say, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you've committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die? You don't have to die. You don't have to be lost. It's God pleading with you. He's pleading with me. Why will you die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. Now I can find that I finally remember Barry and Lucy to bring it up. They mentioned to me Pollyanna. Have you ever seen Pollyanna? Remember the preacher in Pollyanna? If some, some of you who are older remember this, this old Disney movie. It's a classic, and it's a great little film. And the preacher in it, in, in most of the film, early on, before he's softened, his heart is softened by sweet uh, Pollyanna and her positive outlook, he just blisters from the pulpit when he preaches on hell. You almost get the impression he's glad that people are going to hell and that most of the people in this church were going too. You know, the way he preached, it was just so, uh, just, you know, spittle flying out of his mouth and just, you know, wrath. And, and, you know, a lot of times, look at Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, in revival meetings, and in the, uh, uh, the great revivals in American history. Many people responded to that, what we call hellfire and brimstone preaching. And that's powerful preaching in a sense. Now, he does come to have a more balanced perspective by the end of the movie. Spoiler alert, sorry, but watch it. Uh, there's a bigger spoiler I won't give away if you haven't seen it, but, uh, but God's saying, no, God doesn't want that, and it doesn't have to happen for any of us. Turn and live. 
That this is what the New Testament says. God's not willing that you should perish. He wants you to repent. He wants you to turn to Him. That's the idea. Repent and be baptized. All your sins can be forgiven. So when you stand before Him in judgment, there'll be no condemnation because you responded to God's offer and the blood of Christ washed away your sins. As Jerry was saying at the Lord's table, and you walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7 through 9. You continue to follow Christ. And even in our, in our struggles with sin, the blood of Christ will keep us cleansed. And we can have that confidence. But I want to finish with the same warning that we already looked at in the first lesson on hell. Mark 9, Jesus says, cut off your hand. Cut off your foot. Pluck out your eye. This is very provocative language where Jesus being very graphic and the point of course is Jesus saying it's better it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell and two hands to be thrown into hell with two feet to be thrown into hell he doesn't mean for us to dismember our bodies but this is a way of saying look in hell the suffering is forever and your choices are gone there is nothing so precious to you there ought to be nothing that means so much to you that you would lose your soul for it. Whatever's standing between you and God, Jesus says, cut it off. Get rid of it. It's not worth losing eternity with God. Nothing is worth losing your soul for. Your soul meant everything to the Lord. That's why he stepped in to save you from that fate with unimaginable suffering on Calvary. What does it mean to you? If we can help you be sure that you're saved from the wrath to come, let us know. All of us can leave here, headed to heaven. That's what God wants. Let's stand and let's sing this song together.